I never thought I would see a movie theater that said Shin Kamen Rider on it, or Shin Kamen. We made it. It's Shin Kamen Rider time. Let's go. All right, so I just got back from the theater a couple of hours ago from seeing Shin Kamen Rider. I loved it a lot. I loved it a ton. It's not without its flaws, and I think people on Twitter in the last couple of hours, I've just been kind of letting my thoughts sort of gather and collect and everything, and I think a lot of people on Twitter are kind of saying similar things that I'm going to kind of say here today, uh, because I do agree that there are some, not glaring issues with this film, but it's not like a perfect film by any means, and I'm not blind to its shortcomings. However, like this... I don't even know exactly like what my expectations were for this film, but it was something that I really, really enjoyed. So my history with the original Comrade series, just to kind of get that out of the way, is not like as much as like some people, you know, I have not seen all 98 episodes of the original 1971 to 1973 run. I have seen like maybe 10 of them, <laughs> like 10, maybe a little bit more than 10 of them is optimistic. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever actually seen an episode uh, that has Kamara and Nigo in it. I don't think I've ever even made it that far into the show. But I do know the kind of general, like, idea or the general kind of beats that this movie hits in, in reference to the original series. And I think what it does as a film in terms of kind of retelling the original, basically kind of retelling the original 13 episodes or so in the span of a two-hour film, I think it does that pretty successfully, not perfectly though. I think I kind of just want to start with my thoughts on the characters themselves and sort of then go from there in terms of my thoughts on the plot and everything like that. So until a certain part in this video, which I'll put a stamp on or a timestamp up right now, this will be a spoiler free review. And then once we get to that timestamp is when I'll dive into spoilers and stuff for the film if you haven't seen it yet. So first of all, let's talk about Takashi himself. I think that he was a really compelling character. I really do like what this film does in terms of diving into the more darker aspects of being a comrade, especially comrade Ichigo. Being the reformed cyborg turned from shocker grunt dude to good guy, uh, you know, escaped from the scientist facility and everything to then fight the organization that gave him powers. It's the classic Kamen Rider origin story. A lot of other comrades follow similar tropes or similar sort of origins to him. He's the iconic, the classic, and I think that they do a really good job not only redoing that kind of origin story, but also really diving into the more kind of like moral obligations or the kind of questions that one would have if something like that happened to them. And I think that that is definitely a really, really cool aspect that I think this character handles really well in this film, and I really like the kind of arc that he goes on. However, I will say I was a little disappointed by Ishimanji, and I know a lot of people are saying that that is going to be their kind of top character for the film, and I totally get it. I really, really liked Kamaru Nigo in this film. I just wish he was in this film longer, and I think that, that is kind of a detriment to what this film is trying to do. I think it's maybe trying to bite off a little bit more than it could chew, or trying to get through such a fast-paced retelling of the original Comrade show, that it feels like he kind of just shows up out of nowhere. We'll talk about this more in spoilers. And he also just feels like he's not in the film for a long period of time. But when he is there, I really do like his character. I just felt that, like, there's no problems with the actor. There's no problems with the character. Just the film itself did not give him enough time to become a character that I really, really like. But I really enjoyed the chemistry that the two writers had. I think this is a great duo of double writers. And I think that this, once again, was just another strong iteration of these two characters. And I would really like to see more from this universe, especially from these two actors in these roles. I also really enjoyed Ryuko's character, which was a character from the original series who was definitely not involved as much in a capacity as this version is. And I can't really say much more than that other than getting into the spoiler territory for things. And so I really liked her character a lot in this film, the kind of she knows everything that's going on and it's just not really going to take all the nonsense kind of character. I think that's a fun, you know, character trope or kind of character role to have in a film like this. And she did a really good job, I think, being a good audience kind of in between between kind of describing what Shocker is, what they do. And, you know, of course, also kind of helping, you know, the two writers sort of become comrades and realize their potential as superheroes. I think she did a really good job being an important role in this film, not feeling like she ever needed to be saved or anything like that, even though it is kind of Hongo's responsibility or mission to protect her. It's her father's dying wish. I think they did a good job taking her character's role from the original series and expanding on it in a way that made her feel a little bit more important here than she did in the original show. Not that she wasn't there, but in this one, I just like what she does in this film and where she fits in. I also really like the agent dudes that are part of the anti-shocker organization thing that recruits Ryuko and Hongo. Really like those characters a lot. 
not only were I just thought that they were fun, but there's also something about them that I don't want to say yet because of the spoiler aspect of this, that when they revealed it, I went, oh, that's clever. I like that a lot. And that's pretty much all I can say about them without going into spoiler territory. So there's that. The villains in this film were so much fun. I thought this was a really, really fun version of the Shocker characters. You had the classics, you had Spider-Man, you had Batman, you had B-Woman, uh, you know, not necessarily called that, they're called, they're called like arguments uh, in this universe, or, so it was always like Bat-Og or Spider-Og or whatever it may be. But I really thought the designs of taking the original Showa era monsters, which were of course wacky and crazy as they usually are, and making them into these more modern you know, evil or darker versions, but they still felt like tokusatsu characters. You still saw literally like zippers opening up on suits and everything for arms to come out, like in the case of Spider-Man uh, and the Batsa one did that later on as well. The Batsa Chameleon one did that as well. So I think that that was just a really neat idea to make them still feel definitely like a tokusatsu thing and a crazy, wild, alien, fun, gimmicky thing, but also like not as silly as the original suit designs. I think Bee Woman was a perfect example, or, or she was called a Wasp in this one, Hachi. I think that that was a perfect example of upgrading that suit. I really liked the whole sword thing that she had going on. I loved the, just the helmet that she had, but like making things light up is just an easy, easy way to make things look cool, and it definitely does in this case for her design and for all of these. I was really impressed by the monster designs for these. I can't talk about the main villain of this film, because that is also a spoiler, and I won't get into that yet. So then again, they have shown him off in a lot of the marketing material, so it's one of those things to where you might already know about him anyway, which is unfortunate. I kind of wish that you would be able to go in not knowing that this certain character was going to be a thing in this film, but there's that. I think that's going to do it for the spoiler-free version of this, so if you're stopping here, thank you guys for watching this part, and be sure to check it out. It is going to get additional screenings this Monday, June 5th, for the Fathom Events thing, because uh, that's obviously where I saw it. I saw it at my local theater last night on May 31st, and then it's coming back June 5th uh, for a couple more showings throughout the U.S., so stay tuned for that if you, you know, didn't get to catch it. I think the first one I want to talk about, because I know it's sort of the spoiler thing I want to talk about the most before I kind of get into my more negative-ish aspects of this film is Kamen Rider number zero. So number zero, Ichiro, the butterfly augment, was the main villain of this film. And the thing is, is that I really liked him. I knew that this was a character in this film, or I knew that this was a suit in this film, uh, because the figure art leaked that pretty easily. Uh, there was a poster and stuff like that. There was Shoto figures that leaked it. Pretty much about a month after the film came out in Japanese theaters, they started revealing all of his merchandise and just said, well, screw you guys in the US who haven't seen it yet because we're starting to launch all the pre-orders for the spoiler stuff. So it was just kind of a unavoidable thing. Now, to be fair, I didn't know how that character factored into this thing. I didn't know who the character was. I mean, the second that they introduced the brother and the butterfly augment, I knew it was going to be him because he had like the blue suit and everything and all that kind of stuff, but it was still cool. I really like his suit a lot. I liked his character's role, but <laughs> I think this kind of uh, starts to dive into the things that I did not like as much about this film. The pacing for this film is wild, so <laughs> I don't think it's paced very, very well, and I don't know how I feel about the structure of the film. I, I think it's a conflicting thing. I did not realize necessarily that this was going to be such a episodic film if that makes any sense and that's because this is truly like four episodes of Kamen Rider kind of like there are four or five or whatever like stitched together one after one so you get like the first episode where he fights the spider then he fights the bat then he fights the bee then he fights the butterfly and that's basically that but like it's basically just like four episodes of Kamen Rider just stitch it into a movie like the spider really doesn't have much impact on what happens with the bat fight or what happens with the bee fight or what happens with the butterfly fight and it's not a problem with the film but it kind of makes the whole end fight feel a little not anticlimactic because it still feels like the big fight of the film the one with the most consequences the one that's the strongest one for the two double riders to overcome but what that leads to is it leads to problems with like Comrade and Nigo in general, which is one of my biggest disappointments with this film, is that they have to rush through him being evil or brainwashed, and they also just have to rush through his introduction. He just shows up in this film. And like, to be fair, I have not seen the original Nigo debut episode from the original Comrade show, so I don't know how abrupt of a appearance that Nigo has into the show. I know that he wasn't a planned character, he was introduced when Ichigo's actor, you know, got injured, hurt his leg in a motorcycle accident, which is funny, because uh, they do actually kind of reference that, because Ichigo does get his leg injured in the film around the time that Nigo shows up for the first time. But, like, literally, I think he's probably evil for, like, 
maybe 10 minutes, and even that might be optimistic. Like, he has a brief fight with Ichigo, and then Ryuko is able to undo the brainwashing, and he's like, well, shoot, I'm gonna be a comrade now, too. He gets the scarf from her, like he, like she did, like she gave Hongo earlier on, and then he fights with him, and it's like, okay, and the thing is, is that I really like the ending of this film, and that's where I really liked Nigo a lot in here, and like I said earlier in the spoiler-free part, I really liked his character. I thought he was a fun character. He had some funny moments. He had great chemistry with Hongo. He was a really charming character. And I know that Nigo is a very popular fan favorite rider character kind of for that reason in the original series. So I think they were able to capture that spirit of him very nicely in the film. I just wish we got to see more of him. And I think that that could be something remedied if we do get a sequel to this. But I don't know if we are. I don't think we are. I don't think this is necessarily set up to be a franchise in any sorts. Although, I would definitely welcome that if that was the case. I wasn't sure exactly, like, I, I was, I didn't know if this was going to be a full, like, you know, smaller condensed version of all 98 episodes of Kamen Rider. Thankfully, it is not. There is no final fight with the great leader of Shocker. They introduce him. He's not called that in this film. He's called I in this film. He's an AI, you know, artificial intelligence sort of leader of Shocker in the background. And you definitely get that sort of, like, omnipresent aspect of him like the great leader had in the original show and you kind of set up the fact that Nigo who's a combined Ichigo and Nigo at the end which I'll talk about goes off to fight him and you, you know like you know in your mind oh he's gonna go have further adventures with him eventually he will go and have to fight the great leader of Shocker that's where this will eventually go I don't mind that we have to go all the way from episode 1 to episode 98 in one movie I think that would have been not the greatest idea which is why I really do like the comrade number zero character but I also just felt like he's he gets mentioned like probably halfway in he gets mentioned like around the b fight uh that you know his sister mentions that he's gonna hatch from the cocoon or whatever soon and he's gonna be fully realized and then they're gonna deal with him and I, there's probably like another mention of him earlier on that i didn't catch but since everything's moving so fast i probably didn't catch it or if there was one so it kind of does feel like he sort of just gets introduced at some point because he gets introduced i think like first name dropped or mentioned of existence really whatsoever like after the great leader introduced so you always so if you if you're a fan of the original show you know anything about it you kind of feel like that's going to be sort of where we're heading and then we kind of take a curve <laughs> it's like oh no we're going to fight this butterfly dude who's going to also be a comrade which is not something from the original show i think you still have aspects of the original show from that because uh, he has this whole little army of grasshopper rider like soldiers which thankfully from the toys we can actually get a good look at what these suits look like because you can't in the movie because they are just in a big tunnel dark tunnel fight with a bunch of cgi so you really can't get a good look at them whatsoever but there is a good look with the vinyl figure and a shoto candy toy figure and i like these a lot these are i assuming kind of supposed to be this movie's version of the shocker riders uh, from the end of the show which means they kind of do go all the way towards the end of the original series but like not really so it's it's a weird thing because like you know you're, you're really following the like the first 13 episodes pretty faithfully you know you start with the spider you have the bats and then you have the whole thing where everybody's turning into bubbles Ririko's character is a thing only in the first 13 episodes you introduce Nigo at the end so you, you really are adapting sort of the first 13 to 15 ish episodes of the original series and then you kind of bring in aspects from the end of it which is fine but it's just kind of a weird thing to where it's like it almost feels like this movie was sort of trying to juggle between being a retelling of the original batch of episodes but also trying to do its own thing that it kind of gets lost in the middle where like halfway through it's like we're just going to do it now we're going to do our own thing uh, and it doesn't necessarily feel like as coherent as like what the front half of the movie was trying to do now people are going to complain about the cgi in this film i really didn't mind it i've seen so much worse from geats on a daily basis or a weekly basis especially with those future writers from geats those are atrocious and i see it all the time in kinoju as well so like bad toei cgi does not phase me whatsoever if you are being experienced to this for the first time in this film, I can get it, but it is better here than it is on the television show. I, I think that it looked perfectly acceptable, and there was parts of it that I thought were cool. Like, the whole fight with the bee woman, which is probably my favorite fight in the film. She was probably, she was definitely my favorite of the monsters. I really did like the final fight, of course, as well. I mean, that was obviously a very solid fight. But I really do like the part where, like, he's, you know, kind of trying to dash all the sword attacks, and that was obviously CGI. And, I don't know, a lot of that worked for me. I thought that that looked pretty solid. Uh, the Batman flying around was... It had, like, the perfect amount of, like, awkwardness. He was, like, almost jumping frames, but, like, it kind of felt right like that was going to happen. And, I don't know, the CGI was not anything that bothered me or took me out of it whatsoever. Anytime that I saw its use, I said, that makes sense for it to be used here. I think they didn't overuse it. I think they used it where it felt appropriate to use it. They also used practical effects and miniatures 
a lot more than I would have expected. I was watching a behind the scenes thing, which I might be putting clips up of right now. They actually blew up a little model of that cabin. They flipped over models of those trucks at the beginning of the film. And so it has all that kind of iconic, it's a good mixture of like recreating Showa techniques of making tokusatsu shows, like how they would have done it in the seventies. And of course also being a modern era thing and using like CGI, like the Raywell era would do. And I think that that was a really, really cool thing that I thought worked really well for this film. And of course, the final scene is Comrade Ichigo and Nigo. Uh, Nigo being like the body, but Ichigo's soul being in the helmet, uh, getting the like shin suit or like the more kind of modern look that you think of when you think of Ichigo and Nigo, being one unified rider who rides off in the distance to fight Shocker. It looks beautiful. It's just basically the movie suit painted into the colors of the typical Ichigo and Nigo that you think of. But I like that ending. It was definitely a different thing. I didn't expect them to kind of merge at the end. Definitely would not have expected that, but I like it a lot. I'm kind of surprised we haven't gotten merch for that yet, uh, but at least they didn't spoil that for anybody who didn't know about that, at least as far as I know. I don't think there's any merch or anything like that that's been announced for it, so that was cool. And then at the very end of the film, they played a little montage, and like this is after the credits, they played a little montage of clips from the original series, which I love that as well. But overall, I thought this film was excellent. It was a very fun theater-going experience. I never thought I would get to see Kamen Rider on the big screen, like here at home with subtitles. You know, I'm always watching it on my computer, and I've been doing that for 10 years. I never thought I would get to see it on the big screen with a film officially brought over here with subtitles, even if it was just for one night only, now two nights. This was really cool. It was really fun to see everybody talk about it on the fandom on Twitter. I had a blast with it. I would love to see more of this universe. I know that there's a manga that ties into this that I like to try to get somehow and kind of read that. It's kind of like a prequel manga. I would definitely be interested in looking into that. Hopefully, they're going to get an official like US DVD or Blu-ray release of this because I would easily buy that. I definitely want to watch it again, and I'm definitely really intrigued now to watch the other Shin films because I haven't seen any of them. This was the first Hideaki Anno production that I've seen. And uh, I am definitely impressed with the shots in this film, the cinematography, the, you know, just every, the look of everything was really, really pretty. And overall, I was very, very satisfied. So like I said, let me know your guys' thoughts down in the comments below about Shin Kamen Rider or anything about Kamen Rider in general, the Shin stuff, the original stuff. And of course, until next time, you guys can follow me on Twitter at LivingMajorKey or PR. and I'll see you all later. I have no idea if I'm... Are you recording? I think I'm recording. Okay. <laughs> So, we just got out of Shin Kamen Rider like five minutes ago. I had to go pee, of course. But, um, yeah, that was good. <laughs> it was really, really good. Um, Katie, my girlfriend, is recording this right now, so thanks to her. <laughs> um, I think she liked it. Uh, I, yeah, I was trying to, like, sit here and, like, think about it. Like, I'm definitely going to buy some stuff. Of course, you are. <laughs> of course you are. Of course you are. Not even a doubt there. Um, I'm thinking... Do I collect figure arts on this one? Yes. Alright, I should get figure arts for this one. Me and some this stuff. But yeah, I loved it. It's okay. It's okay. To wrap up this video, I'd like to thank my $5 and above patrons, Jurassic Samurai, Maggot Alchemist, Robert Browning, Static Thunder, Brendan Overland, Maji Yellow, MCPC Studios, Comics 1017, James Darty, John Luke, Eric Berry, Tyler Bezetsky, Matthew Thorne, Josh Landry, Pyramidus, Midas, ZPT Tesla, Cross SCV, Caboose Ed, Socket Monsters, Anthony Love, Daniel Pika, Hella Geo, Thrasher, Jesus Prime, and Uni Warrior Thomas. You can support Toku Topics for as little as $1 a month on my Patreon, linked in the description below.